continue with our series, and um, as we carry on with, uh, with this campaign that we have started, we said we want to hear from God. And one of the things uh, that uh, we really want to learn is how God speaks to us, and we also want uh, to distinguish God's voice when he speaks to us, and we want to be careful to be obedient uh, to the voice of God. And today we are looking at to when God speaks. When God speaks. And uh, my, my sermon today I have titled it Laying Down My Isaac. And we are going to be looking at the story of Abraham. We are going to be looking at the son of promise Isaac that was given to him. And we're going to look at the whole story of how this all began and how uh, Abraham, Arielon, uh, Abraham reacted when God made, he, or he spoke to him and made and demand on him. You see, when Abraham was called by God to leave his father's family, God may have wanted him to be in a place where he would be away from the noise of the country of Haran, to be in a place where God speaks to him and there will be no other noise. He would listen and God will give him instructions on how he wanted to impact the generations that were coming. Genesis chapter 12, we find that story. For God separated him from his father's family so that he could pay attention to him. You see, when God wants to capture our attention, he may remove us from the noise so that we can listen to him. And I know that there are many times that God has spoken to us but uh, the atmosphere of where we are, there is so much noise that we barely can hear. His voice, we barely can tell that it is him who is speaking. How many of you have been into a noisy matatu? And you receive a phone call. Is it easy to answer? Especially what we are on You know, some of our matatus, they are full of music, they are full of noise that even when we receive a phone call, you, you call somebody and the answer now these days is, I'm in a noisy matatu, I will call you when I alight. And you know, sometimes the spaces that we occupy or where we live, it is so noisy, we are filled with so much noise of the things that are happening in the world that we, we, we barely can hear the voice of God. So sometimes, God may remove you from that place, a place perhaps you think it is your place of comfort, and set you apart and send you somewhere just so that you can hear him. And last Sunday we said that we want to be partners of God. We talked about being God's partners. Whereas it is the best place to be, yet it is the most difficult because when God seeks our attention, he may choose to remove every noise that causes deafness to his voice. And sometimes uh, the noise around us, we have become so accustomed to it that we cannot be able to stay away from that noise. And it has become a place of our comfort. So much so that God has been around, he has been coming, he has been speaking, but we have neither seen him nor heard his voice. And so for some of us, we may learn it God's way, by him telling us, we will have to move from your father's family. You have to go to a land where I am going to show you because there I want to use you for the purposes of the generations that are coming. Hallelujah. 
You see, we, we so much focus on where we are, the many times we think about me and I, that it is all about my comfort, it is all about what I want in life, and so much we have surrounded ourselves, we have built walls around ourselves, that even God does not have a way of getting to where we are. And so even when God wants to use us, we have perimeter walls. Many of us want to go and live in gated communities. And gated communities, they, they have a, a, a wall that is surrounding the entire community. But even when we get our own one eighth and a quarter, <laughs> we also put a wall and a big gate. <laughs> And so you have to walk through the first gate and you have to sign there and get screened and then you have to come to my one eighth and there also I have put another Ascari. Now when you fence the one eighth, what are you left with? <laughs> you see, God wants to remove us from all this noise. God wants us to have some freedom. He wants us to be comfortable. He wants us to, to be able to welcome him. He wants us to, to, to be able to fellowship uh, with him. And that is why, because he loves us so much and he wants to use us, that he wants us to be part of the plan that he has for the generations that are coming. And that is why we said for the project that we have, please do not look at it from the point of our comfort. Look at it from the number of young people that are going to be married in that church. Look at it uh, uh, to, to, from the point of how many people will come and receive the Lord Jesus Christ in that sanctuary. See it from the point of view how many children will come there and they will be dedicated in that sanctuary. Praise God. And then you will see that God wants to use you beyond your comfort. You see, friends, God's plan for the children of Israel was never about Abraham. God only chose him as an obedient servant who was willing to partner with him in his glad plan. And so at 75 years of age, Abraham was invited to be a partner with God to bring up a generation God sent him and told him, in this land, I promise my people. Remember at that time, the children of Israel had not even gone to Egypt. They had not even been delivered. And already God was speaking about what was going to happen in the generations that were coming. And we said last Sunday that God is a God of generations. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6. God enters into a covenant with Abram. And it says that after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your great reward. God starts with an assurance. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eriaza of Damascus? And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. If you look at this scripture, Abram is looking at himself and his family and his name. He is seeing how will this promise of God become, yet God does not seem to have done the needful. Then the Lord came to him. And he said, this man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And verse 6 says, Abram believed the Lord. Hallelujah. And he credited to him as righteousness. From this story, 
We can only expect that Abram was so excited and he must have run and told his wife, guess what? This is what God is saying. After all, after this many years, we are going to get a child. You see, Arya in chapter 12, God had already given Abram a promise to become a father of a great nation. But now in chapter 15, it is a sealing of a covenant. But after this, God went silent. God went silent. And it is not until Abraham is 99 years, 24 years later, that God appears to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And it is at this time that he is affirming the covenant. But a lot has happened between the time of the promise and when Isaac comes. You see, God, we will speak over your life. But we never receive nor hear what God is saying or even hook into his plan because of our anxiety. And we know that God has spoken into our lives. And we know the things that he has said over our lives. But the expectation and the anxiety and the eagerness for us to get there quickly comes between us and the timing of God. So today I want us to talk a little bit about anxiety. Last week we talked about sin and how sin separates us from hearing God. And we talk about uh, anxiety and how sometimes uh, this anxiety can take away the voice of God from us and we never get to hear what he is saying to us. In the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 and 7, he says, Be anxious of nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God. And the what? And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. It is not normal. You are not having that peace because you are assured of what God is going to say. He says you guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Because God wants us to take the anxiety away. We are dealing with a couple here that missed the heart of God because of their anxiety. Perhaps they were thinking about their age. Perhaps they were thinking about time. Perhaps they were thinking about their health. Perhaps they were undergoing a lot of pressure from the community. Because God has spoken, they perhaps have told everybody that uh, this is what God has said in our life, and yet it does not seem to come through, and they are starting to wonder, did God speak? And so God continues to speak. But because of the noise that is around us, because of what people are seeming to achieve, because of our peers, we don't get there. Some of us, we look at the people that we went to school with, and we see what they have been able to achieve in life. And so we want to go there quickly and achieve that. We are living in a generation of microwave. We want everything to now and now. If it is not now, Nihibi Sasa, is that what you say? Bwana Sifiwe. My mother taught me to make the African tea. And the African tea, if I tell you sit down for a cup of tea, you've got to be ready to wait. Because you have to boil the water and the milk together and you have to put uh, the, the tea leaves and you have to let it boil and you have to keep on stirring it as it is boiling and you have uh, to, to keep on uh, uh, boiling. Now I can see the people of my generation. They understand exactly what I mean. But to the rest of, uh, the, to the rest of Kenyans, they have invented something they call a microwave. 
Sit down for a cup of tea. Even before you sit down, the cup of tea is on the table. Because they just needed to go and get a cup of water and put a little bit of milk and put it into this magical thing and they press a few buttons and voila, miracle happens. Before you sit down, your cup of tea is there. And you know, that is sometimes how we are treating God. That he speaks to us and we are asking him tomorrow, I thought you said this yesterday. And we get into trouble because God is not a microwave God. Okay, I will repeat that later on. He says, be anxious of nothing. He says, be content. Learn to trust in me. So what we are saying, or the, rather the question that we must ask ourselves is, does God speak in silence during this time that he seems to be silent? Is he still speaking? And this is what I want us to learn today, friends, that silence is a spiritual discipline that we must all learn. That God, though he does not seem to be saying anything, that does not mean that he is not speaking. And we must be content on the place where we are and we must learn to hear his silent voice. Because silence is more than a conversation with God. Because God continues to change and to influence our lives. Because God has already spoken his word. Hallelujah. And he is expecting us to obey that word, to trust that word. For this couple, he, expect, he expected them to trust his word. But they went ahead. And we know that they executed a plan B. Because they looked at the waiting period. And they felt like God was saying nothing in 24 years. And so by this they went 13 years ahead of God. Because by the time Isaac is coming, Ishmael is already 13 years. God has taught us his language. He has taught us to pray. He has taught us to connect with him. He has uh, taught, us, taught us to have a communion with him. He has taught us how to communicate with him. And as we continue in the conversations that we have with God, we will no longer hear the noisy world that is around us but we shall be able to hear God because he will remove us from the noisy place to a place where we can hear him. God is teaching us that silence is more than a conversation with him. And God says this, that there is a time for everything, a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be silent, and a time to speak. Ecclesiastes 3.17. He says be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Wait patiently for him. Psalm 37 and verse 7. He also says be still and know that I am God. Psalms 40 and verse 10. So God is never removed in our presence. He continues to speak to us and it is up to us to learn and to mature in our walk with God and to understand when he speaks and to know that it is not just about us but it is about the glad plan of God and what he wants to do not just for us but for the generations and generations that he cares about. So how does God speak through silence? How does he speak? God wants us to trust in him. That when he has spoken, his uh, speech is continuous present. That what he has uh, spoken, when he has given his word, he is not a man that he is going to change his commitment to us. Hallelujah. Somebody praise God. Many of us hear God. And we know what he has asked of us. We know what he wants us to do. But we still await our assurance that he is going to compensate us. So we put a condition to the speech of God. And some of us have prayed over your life and how you want her to be. 
And God seems to have laid a good plan for you. What has he done? He has given you a good job. He has given you a good income. And so you have been saving of this glad home that you and your family want to own. Or this car you want to drive. Or this wedding that you want to have. Because you have uh, always uh, reviewed those tapes of Princess Diana as she walked down. And you say, I will wear a dress like Princess Diana. Do they have a princess in America? Then God checks in. And he comes and he says, hey, we are building a sanctuary. And he speaks and he says to you, you shall give this amount. Wah, 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 wah. Praise God. Praise God. Mm -hmm. And then the debate begins. And you start asking God, I thought you told me I will be a father of a great nation. I thought you said that I am going to have this wedding I have always wanted to. I thought you said that I will live in this glad home. I thought you said, I thought you said, and now you're asking me to give away. And the debate goes on. And you start asking, did I hear from God? Because you want him to assure you that if you give, he is going to compensate. This is hard gospel. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Okay, one or two people. God wants us to learn to trust in him. That when he gives his word, he will keep it. We have had God and we know that he has, what he has asked us to do. <laughs> Friends. All things come from God. I said all things come from God. Even what is in your hands came from him in the first place. And God, in his amazing way, he is willing to take us to the next level like he did with Abraham to build him to be a committed partner with God. And so that is why we are going to look at how Abraham was built in the years that were coming. That he tested him with the very son of promise, Isaac. That even after God seems to have come and fulfilled him, God still wanted to remove him from the noisy place. And this is our biggest test. That when God wants to build a partnership with us, he wants us to truly withhold nothing from him. And so Abraham is uh, taken to Genesis chapter 22. And the scriptures say that sometimes later God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. That means that he had God. Then God said, take your son, your only son, to whom, sorry, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there. As a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Now the scriptures are talking about an only son. And yet God, uh, Abraham had another son called Ishmael who was older. But God is talking about an only son. Why? Because God does not recognize your plan B. Did you hear what I say? That God does not recognize your plan B. God has only one plan, and that is his plan, and his plan is Isaac. But God is going to come one day, and he is going to ask you, I want Isaac, I want you to lay down your Isaac, I want that Isaac to come back to me, because I have a plan for you, and I know how I'm going to execute it, praise God. So I don't know which Isaac you are wrestling with God. God said, take this son, your only son. But verse 3 says, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had caught 
cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place where God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. And as the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. And when they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bowed his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Listen to God. God is saying, now I know. God is saying, now I know. And I hope that God is going to be saying to one of us that now I know that you trust in me, that there is nothing you can withhold from, him, from me. So Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over there and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Say with me, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Partnering with God means trusting him fully. Not just with our life, with everything that we have. You see, when we come to Christ, we say that Christ is the Lord of my life. What that should mean is he is, we are not just saying we are saved, we are saying me and everything. We are saying with Joshua, me and my family. We are saying that everything that we have belongs to him. And time to time, God is going to test our loyalty. And he is going to test our, our trust by asking us to yield to him with all that we have. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 17, it says that by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. And remember it is through Isaac that the seed of Abraham was to be called. But when God called Abraham, Abraham this time round had so, had so much trust in God that he believed that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. And God is expecting us to mature to that place to know that God himself is able to do immeasurably much more than what we can think or even imagine. And this church, we are privileged because we have the testimony of God. Hallelujah. Because several years ago, God asked us through our bishop to put up the connection center. It was a big goal, but we trusted God. We have a facility where our children go to. 250 million shillings. We don't owe a bank a dime. We have done it with our hands because God came through for us. Hallelujah. And so we must mature. We must come from Genesis chapter 15 and go to Genesis chapter 22 and learn that the God who did the connection center is going to do his own sanctuary. Hallelujah. And if I called uh, testimonies here, we would be here until evening because God has done so much for so many of us through our obedience. And so I want to encourage you, friends, 
That the goal that we have is just obedience. It is God testing us. It is God asking, are you ready to trust me a second time? You saw what I did. I'm able to do even much more greater than what you can think or imagine. So what has God required of you? That is causing you sleepless nights. And you are finding difficult to obey. Have you ever been tested by God? In this way before. Was he faithful to repay you in great measure? Friends. This is a season of obeying God. It is a season that God is going to teach us to trust in him fully. It is a season that we are going to mature in our faith that we shall never be the same again. Hallelujah. You remember how Abraham responded after God kept silent? Him and his wife went to their plan B, isn't it? And his wife had a very good plan. And she offered Hagar to Abraham to bear him a son. But this was not the plan of God. But now the second time round, when God asked for Isaac, Abraham had matured enough to know how to release. Praise God. He had understood that God is not limited by time. He had known and he understood that if God is asking for Isaac, he knows about tomorrow. We see, we worry, we are anxious because we don't know how tomorrow we will be. And so we want that place of comfort, that place of assurance, that today God has said move, we are asking him, will it rain or shine tomorrow? But God wants us to be in that place. It doesn't matter whether it will rain, whether it will shine tomorrow. It doesn't matter which government will be in power. God is saying, I will be there tomorrow. Hallelujah. And that is all that matters. You're looking at your age and you're saying that God is asking me to give this. And he knows I, I am I'm going for retirement. Hallelujah. This is for me for retirement. Did you know that he is the giver of life? Did you know that he is the one who has numbered your days? Hallelujah. Did you know that perhaps that will cause you to, will cause him to increase your retirement days? Hallelujah. Okay, let me ask the guys at the back, you people at the front. Did you know that God can come during your retirement years at the back? If God came to Abraham during the sunset years, God is able to come through for you now. Hallelujah. And this is where God is taking us to learn to trust in him because he cares about our welfare, because he cares about us when we obey, because he wants us to experience the joy of fellowship and partnering with him. Praise the Lord. So I want us to learn a few lessons today. And the number one lesson I want us to learn is that God wants us to give ourselves wholeheartedly and reserve nothing from him. He has given us all things that belong to him. And what he is asking of us is what already belongs to him. Praise God. So you are not going to do God a favor. He is saying, can you give me back what I have given to you? Because I want to repackage it for you. Because I want to give it over to you. Because when I give it to you, it will look different. Because when I give it to you, it will have multiplied. Because when I have touched it with my hand, it will be made of gold and silver. And you will live in a place of comfort. Somebody praise God. Because God is saying, I am not just testing you. I am building you, I am changing you, I am strengthening your faith because everything including you belongs to me. Hallelujah. Oh yes. We will grow and get into a place where we can learn to trust God. The second lesson I want us to take home is that he says, make me your greatest treasure so that I can give myself to you. Mark 12 verse 30. 
He is saying, make me your greatest treasure. That there are no other treasures. There is no other noise around you. God is saying, I'm the greatest for you. I'm the greatest gift that you have ever heard. And this great treasure is myself. If you give yourself to me, I will come and I will dine with you. Third lesson, he says, search for me with your whole heart so that I can reveal myself to you. God wants you to know who he is. God wants you to experience him. God wants you to walk with him. And only in obedience can you be able to get to the presence of God. Hallelujah. This is what God is teaching us. And the fourth lesson, he is asking us to trust him. Trust in me with your heart so that I can guide your steps. Proverbs 3 and verse 5, you can read through 6. And verse 5, uh, and, and uh, lesson 5, he says, Praise me with your whole heart so that I can gift you with my presence. Psalm 9 and verse 1, Trust me with all your heart so that I can gift you with my presence. You see, friends, you don't need gold, you don't need silver, you don't need big houses, you don't need all these other things that make noise around us, that call on to us, that we bind ourselves with. All what God wants and he has promised you is when his presence is with you, you have the whole world. And when we mature, we will no longer be asking the foolish questions of Abraham. We will be acting in the, in the wisdom of Abraham in chapter 22 when he was ready to give everything. And the last lesson, God says, return to me with your whole heart so I can be compassionate and bless you. Return to me. Return to me. Come back. Withhold nothing. Come back with all your heart. And I will be compassionate. And I will bless you. Joel chapter 2 and verse 12. You see, God always gives us an opportunity to come back to him. God has kept the door open for us to continue having a relationship with him. And so in conclusion, God wants to be our friend. He wants us to recognize his voice. He wants us to remove the noise that is around us so that when he, he speaks, we can get to know him and have a fellowship with him to know him personally. God longs for us to spend intimate time with him. This is the place God wants to draw us to, nearer him, having no agenda other than sharing love together with him. God wants us to, to, to stay around him and for us to hear him when he speaks and for us to be able to know his voice and for us to be able to recognize it and for us to be able to know when he says go and when he says come and know that it is him and his voice is clear and distinct to our ear. We know when he has spoken. He wants us to offer our physical senses, the faculties of our souls. He wants us to offer the senses of our spirit so that we can know him fully and know him deeply. He wants us to move out of our comfort box into his overflowing grace, out of our mind into our heart, out of our rationalism, so that it is no longer what makes sense, so that it is no longer what, what is common sense, but become true spiritual Christians that understand the voice of God and how he works because his way is different from the noise of the world. Praise God. Christ gave himself for me. He gave himself for you. Christ died. He gave the best. I'm going to give the best, that will cost me something. I am going to give it to God because it is at that place that I will know that I will become a partner of God. It is at that place that God will become close to me and I will become a true partner with God. He has bought me at a cost replies. I belong. 
I belong. I belong. I belong to him because he bought me at a price. Hallelujah. Would you think about what God wants for you and from you? Would you seek to understand the lesson that God is teaching you through this season? And how you're going to become an active participant of the glad plan that God has, not just for us, but for our children, for our grandchildren, for our great grandchildren, because long when we are gone, long after we are gone, there will be a testimony in that new sanctuary that there were people here who heard the voice of God. And that is why we enjoy what we enjoy, because our great, great, great heard the voice of God and they obeyed. Hallelujah. And so, Father, I'm asking you that in the name of Jesus, you will bless your people. You will bless them with understanding. You will give them the wisdom that you gave Abraham to the point where he was willing to lay down his Isaac. That the Isaac that holds us back, that the Isaac we treasure so much, and you may be asking of, that God, you don't need the Isaac because you have a lamb that you have caught for yourself. But you want to teach us how to trust in you. So I'm praying for your people that in the name of Jesus Christ, you will get us to that place where we learn to wholly and truly trust in you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah.